All right, welcome back to part four of the Razor Crest series. Now we're going to be going over V-Ray Glass. This is the last part of the Razor Crest ship model that we haven't surfaced yet. And uh, there's quite a few settings to go over for glass. Now this is not specific to cockpit glass or ship glass. It works for pretty much any type of glass. So if you are interested in learning about V-Ray materials, then let's get started. Sorry, so select the glass and to create glass in V-Ray, there's a few things that we need to do. First of all, Glass doesn't have any diffuse color. This is black. We can change that to black. And the reflection color is always going to be 100% white because that's PBR. That's the, that's the rule with PBR. And because we're using the metalness roughness workflow, we don't need glossiness. We're going to say roughness. And then there actually is a map for this for roughness, I believe. We go into our textures slot and I believe for the glass there's a there's just one here so technically we don't even need to use in this it's just one so we can just say that and we can just leave that number it's fine and when we do that you can see that now there's like little scratches on the glass which is pretty cool now, just to show you the difference now between roughness and glossiness, if I were to switch this, well, now this is interpreting this image completely in the opposite direction. So for example, if I go back here and I open up this image, anything that is black with glossiness means it's not going to be glossy. It's going to be a very diffuse reflection, very spread out, like a matte finish. And then all the white areas are going to be super bright. And to me, honestly, glossiness makes more sense than using roughness just because I'm more used to seeing things like reflection maps and specular maps and things like that. The types of maps that you don't usually use specular maps, I think, anymore. It just makes more sense to me and it might make more sense to you. It just depends. If you've kind of grown up with roughness, that's fine. So what roughness says is we click roughness on. And then we say, all right, anywhere where it's white now, that's where it's rough. And anywhere that is black, it's going to be not rough. So this is the opposite. So that's what the differences are. So these scratches here, these little bits in the glass, these are considered rough. So like little bits of dirt and specks and stuff going to be rough like that. Then we get a nice, nice reflection. OK, so there's other things we can do, like the Fresnel. So if we turn off Fresnel, by the way, you get some like really bad looking. I mean, there are cases where you don't want a Fresnel reflection, depending on your material. So we do want that fall off, which is it's driven basically by the IOR value, the index of refraction. So you can lock this value right here or you can unlock it and then you can go to town with some other types of effects. So there are cases, especially with glass, that sometimes is pretty tricky to use without changing settings or using IOR and things like that. And the, you can grab IOR maps, but IOR is like really tricky to get right and understand. So usually V-Ray just says 1.6 and that's everything. So you can go and if you have never done this, you can look up like IOR values. And you can get things like, oh, oh I want acrylic gr glass. What is the what is the IOR value of all this stuff? And for the most part, most materials have a very, very similar IOR value. So it really just depends on what you want. Sometimes you can play with this to match some kind of real life shot that you're trying to trying to get. Um, if you go to zero, you basically are like saying there is no Fresnel at all. And Close to zero, you're kind of doing the same thing. This is dimmer. And then at one, everything is absolutely black. It's just pitch black. So I'm not going to get into the science behind that. To be honest, I would have to look that up myself. But usually we just lock that. There are cases where we might want to unlock it to make the highlight a little bit larger and things like that. Also for reflection, there are different types. There's things like Fong. So see how this changes the highlight is a lot sharper there. This blin, pretty common one. Ward. Ward is very nice for like plain metal or it, it can be. It can for very, very nice softer metals or like a painted surface. It can, it, it can be, it can be very nice. For things like glass though, the GGX is, is very similar to blin, but it's a little bit 
more natural looking and it usually gets better reflections, sharper reflections. So we're just going to leave that on GGX. There are just different methods of doing what is called the BRDF. So if you want to get really involved with it, there's resources online, uh, Substance, they have a good guide on all of this stuff if you're interested. And you always have to make sure your reflection color is 100% white. You can't have like, if you're doing PBR, you can't have a little bit of reflections. And you also, unfortunately, can't do things like red. Like that's not PBR compliant. Now, if you're just trying to make some weird, wacky looking material, I mean, it's what looks good. That's the ultimate reality of, of all things CG. If it looks good, you've won. Okay. And you did a good job. But try to follow the workflows for the most part. Occasionally you can bend the rules. And PBR, as I said, is one specific workflow. It is not the only workflow. So there are ways and reasons why you might need to do things like that. So that's why the option is available. Uh, metalness, though, you, you should never have like partially metal objects. It just makes sense. But I think also there is a there is a normal map that comes with this to actually get surfaces on here. So for surfaces, we need to change this to normal map, grab our map, and then go to file, load in that image. And I believe this is just a singular map as well. Grab that. This is going to be utility raw. And, and notice if I leave this on sRGB, the normal map is wrong. Not what you saw in substance, for example. So changing that to raw kind of shows you that it's right. Um, next, how do we actually make this transparent? Good question. So we have a refraction channel here. So refraction is light that passes through a surface. Reflection is light that bounces off a surface. So we can crank that up and you can see. I think I need to change the light orientation here. Uh, let me grab this. Actually, I'm going to go back to my other view just so I can see that line a little bit more clearly. And uh, I'll just move that there. Yeah, unfortunately, the V-Ray viewport IPR sometimes doesn't update or doesn't let you get out of it unless you stop it. So that's why I just did that. Uh, this might be a better view to, to see this part. But there's also uh, this annoying feature. <laughs> see how you zoom in? It gets darker and darker and darker. Uh, that's the auto exposure at work on the camera. Let me show you how to fix that. So we click our camera. And I realized I never actually showed you where the V-Ray extra attributes were that we added earlier. Uh, we've got to go down here to extra V-Ray attributes. And uh, by default, when you add your V-Ray extra attributes, it adds a node here. So it was super bright if this is not on. But when you add that, it automatically checks that. And then you get things like your, your aperture and your uh, ISO and shutter speeds and stuff like that. So as we zoom in, it's, it's kind of dumb. Uh, you can do what is called specifying your focus and specifying the focus allows you to zoom in usually and it's fine. Uh, it's kind of annoying that you do that. This is also used for the depth of field, but uh, we're good. Let's just turn that on if you want to be able to zoom in and not have issues. Uh, you can also do things like, hey, I, I want to increase the the camera sensors sensitivity to light. So you can be like, whoa, I can make that way brighter. Uh, usually cameras actually do have like an ISO of like 400 just as like native. But then on the, your F number, you can increase your F number. You can decrease that. And there's also usually exposure controls. So you can say, hey, I don't want to, I don't want it to determine it. I want to determine it. And I want to have my exposure value is this notch. So like 13, like on a camera, you'd have like a, a exposure notch. So something like that. This is all, it can get a little bit convoluted and not particularly important for what we need. All of these things, though, if you are interested in photography, you can use these and they're pretty accurate to what a camera would do, with the exception of there's not going to be film grain. So usually with a camera, the darker your image, you if you have like a super high ISO, it would make your image super grainy. 
it's not replicated here because you almost never want that. So yeah, you wouldn't be able to make your, your footage look awful, basically. Okay, so I kind of got sidetracked there. Uh, we're talking about glass. So for the glass here, uh, let's select this and then some other things that are useful. So there is an option here for your IOR. So depending on how much light you want to pass through it, you can lower your IOR. So something like 1.1 or like 1.01 to let some stuff pass through. And you can see how it distorts the image. Uh, that's not really going to be like what most glass is going to be though. So if you want to look up the IOR of like actual glass, I think it's a value of like 1.57 or something. You can just type in on this IOR index list, glass, 1.5, okay. 1.5, if you wanted to be super accurate with it, cool. This glass looks a little bit awkward because of this, the shape and I guess the thickness too. So this is dependent on the thickness of the geometry that we have. So if we solo that, so just control one to solo that, and you can see that there really is no thickness on this glass at all. So that's kind of a problem, to be honest. That's, um, that's not correct. We, we really would want to have a little bit of thickness for this to work. You could extrude it backwards and then invert everything, which is probably the, probably the easiest thing to do. So we could do control E. This is going to extrude everything and we just pull that in a little bit. So something like that. And you can see now this actually has thickness. But this is flipped our normal, so we got to go to mesh display reverse. And now this would be correct. If we go back to V-Ray. We can now see the glasses accurate. So with that other way, what we could have done is just say thin walled. So thin walled means it's basically just one one plane, and that's going to give us much better results. Uh, thin walled though is is only for that feature. It's really not for doing anything else. So the thickness is very important when you start using IOR. So if I uh, turn this off, make this even thicker, just make this like ridiculous, just, just for education purposes. And then look at this, you can see how like ridiculously distorted everything is and it's going through all that layer of glass and it looks very, very weird. Okay, with all the different bending that's going on. I'm going to control Z that, put it back. So if you don't have any thickness at all, you, you have to say thin walled, otherwise this is not going to look correct. And of course you can play around with your IOR. Certain types of glass will have different IOR refractions. Uh, you can do some kind of weird, that looks kind of, kind of weird. Uh, but by default, usually it's like 1.5, which looks fine. Now, if you wanted to tint the glass, there is an option here under translucency. The translucency is a little bit, a little bit awkward to explain. I mean, it's usually for subsurface scattering, which is light that goes through a surface. Uh, different to a refraction, though, it's like it's how the light like diffuses underneath, like the skin, for example. Uh, so that's what translucency generally is. If you wanted to change the tint, you can do something like red. But for anything else, if it's like black, for instance. Um, your fog color is, is it's going to be like really sensitive and it's going to usually just fill everything in. You don't have that much range to play with here. Uh, so what I usually do for this is to go up to basically the refraction color and just tint this. This gives you far more control and technically, no, it's not, you're kind of breaking the rules a little bit, but we're just dimming all the light that's coming through. Technically, that's not the same thing as just having you know, a tinted glass, but it makes it look a lot better. And it's way easier to control than just the fog color of the interior of the glass. No, whatever. Okay, that's fine. So if you wanted this to be really, 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 really tinted, that's going to look pretty good. Okay. But what do you think of it though? Light passing through tinted windows is not going to be as bright. So that's fine. Okay. Uh, right. Next. Couple other things. There is also on this refraction glossiness. Uh, refraction, by the way, in V-Ray does use what is called glossiness. It doesn't use roughness. So just bear that in mind. So if you have a refraction glossiness map, you would want to uh, 
change that. So you could use the same image here, the reflection roughness, invert that, pass that through into our refraction glossiness, that's fine. For the most part though, um, if I increase the refraction color here, and then I decided, hey, I want this to be a little bit frosty, the glass to be frosty, just lower your reflect or reflection glossiness and boom, you get you get a, like a really blurry looking glass. So that's pretty cool too. That's how you would get frosted glass, for instance. And if you wanted frosting only around the section, that's why you would have a map on there, a texture map. If you want to like super diffuse textures, more like a lampshade, you would have like really, really diffuse glossiness like that. Uh, glass though is like 99% glossiness for refraction. So that's basically what we're going to do there. Cool. Okay, uh, I need to just lower that just a little bit, make that a little bit dimmer, but that's that's up to you. And there you go. Cool. I'm not really looking at the references of the real thing, but I just wanted to show you some of the materials. Okay, so I hope that makes sense for the material part of this. Now what we got to do is start talking about passes and passes go hand in hand with your materials. So we're going to break this video up into other parts. In the next part, we're going to talk about passes. And then as we progress, we'll talk about render layers. So I highly recommend you play around with this. See what happens when you, you change certain, certain things. Like if you decide that, oh, hey, I don't want my metalness anymore. And you can break the connection. Like what happens to my material? Like what does that look like if I go back to something that's not metal anymore. Like maybe that's what you want. Maybe you want to coat the razor crest in paint. But uh, for the most part though, I do want you to, to, to get an image that looks very much like this uh, with all of your, your nice highlights and, and, and you have all that detail in the normal map and then the roughness map as well. So hopefully this was a review for the most part. Maybe you learned something new about V-Ray if you haven't used V-Ray before. All of this is applicable to any type of render engine. So Redshift, Arnold. If any of you do want to use Redshift or Arnold for this and really just don't want to use V-Ray, I am totally cool with that as long as you are resourceful enough to figure out the differences. But uh, I, I would like you to use V-Ray just so you, you learn something. Okay, but if you want to just learn more about whatever your favorite render engine is, I don't really care. Foundations are the same. Anyway, so the next part, what we're going to do, we're going to take like a, a render of this in the V-Ray frame buffer. I'm going to explain all the different parts of the, the frame buffer and what they're for and what they do. We're going to take that into After Effects, composite that, and basically replicate the same thing that we got through the V-Ray frame buffer, but by extracting all the different passes. So that's going to be the next part of the video. And then after that, what we're going to do is start making an actual scene. So this one went on for a pretty long time, but if this was an actual in-class session, this would probably be the full three hours. So hopefully this is a little bit faster, but I know you have to stop and, and start things as you, as you work your way through it. Have fun playing around with this. This is very important to understand if you want to do 3D visual effects or 3D graphics or any type of CG stuff. It is important that you understand how to get to this point to do, to do lighting and stuff. So we barely scratched the surface of lighting, uh, but using a sun and sky, using an HDR, hopefully that was useful. So as always, let me know if you have any questions and I will see you in the next video. Alright guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions of what we've covered so far, please leave a comment on any one of the videos or post on the Discord server and I would be happy to help. Alright, see you guys in the next video.